Just like in Britain, much of the United States' early industrialization began in the textile industry of New England during the 1820s. But the country's huge size and ready availability of natural resources, its growing domestic market, and its relative political stability combined to make the United States the world's leading industrial power between the end of the Civil War and 1914. In fact, before the start of World War I, the United States produced 36% of the world's manufactured goods compared to 16% for Germany, 14% for Great Britain, and 6% for France. The United States government played an important role in industrialization with tax breaks, huge grants of public lands to railroad companies, laws enabling the easy formation of corporations, and the absence of much overt regulation of industry all fostered the rise of very large business enterprises. The U.S. Steel Corporation, for example, by 1901 had an annual budget three times the size of the federal government. The United States also pioneered techniques of mass production using interchangeable parts, the assembly line, and scientific management to produce goods for a mass market. The nation's advertising agencies, Sears, Roebuck, and Montgomery Ward's mail order catalogs and urban department stores generated a middle class culture of consumption. When the industrialist Henry Ford in the early 20th century began producing the Model T at a price that many American people could afford, he famously declared, I am going to democratize the automobile. Self-made industrialists of fabulous wealth, such as Henry Ford, Andrew Carnegie, and John D. Rockefeller became cultural heroes, wide, widely admired as models of what anyone could achieve with daring and hard work in a land of endless opportunity. Nevertheless, well before the first Model T rolled off the assembly line, a series of social divisions uh, of a kind common to European and industrial societies were becoming more intense. Pre-industrial America boasted of a relative social equality, quite unlike that of Europe, but by the late 1800s, a widening gap separated the social classes. In Carnegie's Homestead Steel Plant near Pittsburgh, employees worked every day except for Christmas and the 4th of July, often for 12 hours a day. In Manhattan, where millions of European immigrants disembarked, Many lived in five or six story buildings with four families and two toilets on each floor. In every large city, such conditions prevailed close by mansions of elite neighborhoods. To some, this stark contrast went against the American ideals, while others saw it as a natural outcome of competition and survival of the fittest. As elsewhere, such, condi such conditions generated much labor protest, the formation of unions and strikes, sometimes leading to violence. In 1877, when the Eastern Railroads announced a 10% wage cut for their workers, employees went on strike, disrupting rail service across the eastern half of the country, smashing equipment, and rioting. Both state militias and federal troops were called out to put down the movement. In 1892, the entire National Guard of Pennsylvania was sent to suppress a violent strike at the Homestead Steel Plant near Pittsburgh. Class consciousness and class cl conflict were intense in the industrial America of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Unlike many European countries, however, no major political party emerged in the United States to represent the interests of the working class. Nor did the ideas of socialism and especially Marxism appeal to American workers nearly as much as they did in Europe, perhaps because it went against the cultural heroism of people like Ford, Carnegie, and Rockefeller. At its high point, the Socialist Party of America got only 6% of the vote for its presidential candidate in the 1912 election, whereas socialists at the time held more seats in Germany's parliament than any other party. Even in the depths of the Great Depression of the 1930s, no major socialist movement emerged to champion American workers. So why was there such little political change? One reason was the relative conservatism of major American union organizations, especially the American Federation of Labor. Its focus on skilled workers excluded the more radical unskilled laborers, and its refusal to align any party limited its influence in the political arena. Furthermore, the immense religious, ethnic, and racial divisions of the American society contrasted sharply with the more homogenous populations of many European countries, Catholics and Protestants, Irish, Germans, Slavs, Jews, and Italians, whites, and blacks. Such differences undermine the class solidarity of American workers, making it far more difficult to sustain class-oriented political parties and a socialist labor movement. 
Moreover, the country's remarkable economic growth generated an, on average a higher standard of living for American workers than their European counterparts experienced. Land was cheaper and home ownership was more available. Workers with property generally found socialism less attractive than those without. By 1910, a particularly large group of white collar workers in sales, services, and office outnumbered factory workers. Their middle class aspirations further diluted the impulses toward radicalism. But political challenges to the abuses of capitalist industrializ industrialization did, did arise. Among small farmers in the US uh, Southwest and Midwest, Populists railed against banks, industrialists, monopolies, and the existing money system, and both major political parties, all of which they, they thought were dominated by the corporate interests of the Eastern elites. More successful, especially in the early 20th century, were the progressives who pushed for specific reforms, such as wage hours legislation, uh, better sanitation standards, antitrust laws, and greater governmental intervention in the economy, instead of sweeping social change. In fact, a broad political movement like socialism came to be defined as fundamentally un-American in a country that so valued individualism and so feared big government. It was a distinctive feature of the American response to industrialization.